If you haven't done so, please pause the video and try to answer the question on your own before listening on. Our first step in solving this question is to locate the x and y coordinates of where the explosion occurs up here at the highest point of its trajectory. And so we can arrange the information in the following table. But before filling in the table, we just want to mark that this position will be the initial, and then up here where the explosion occurs will be the final. Now the initial velocity in the x direction will be the 20 meters per second multiplied by the cosine of 60. And then for the y direction, the initial velocity will be 20 times the sine of 60. Now we know that since the projectile is reaching its highest point, we can say that the final velocity in the y direction is going to be zero. In the x direction, it's going to be 20 cosine of 60 still, because there's zero acceleration in the x direction. Therefore, the initial and final velocities will be the same. Of course, the acceleration in the y direction will be negative 9.8. We don't yet know the time required to reach that point, and nor do we know the displacement in the x and y direction. Let's go ahead and actually solve for the time. And we can do that by using the information that we've acquired in the y direction. So we can actually first subtract the v naught y over to the left and then divide by acceleration to solve for time. And then, of course, we can plug in the known values for the final velocity, initial velocity, and acceleration. And when we compute this, we can see that the time is roughly 1.767 seconds. And that's going to turn out to be the time for both the x and the y direction. Those times will always be the same in projectile motion questions. Now that we have the time, we can actually go ahead and solve for the displacement in both the x and the y direction. We can begin by doing that in the x direction, and we've noted that the acceleration in the x direction is zero, so this term will drop out, and then we can fill in the initial velocity and the time. And when we compute that, we get roughly 17.67 for the displacement in the x direction, so we'll fill that into the table. And then we'll make the same computation, but this time in the y direction. We'll use the same equation and fill in all the known values from the y direction and we get roughly 15.3 meters. So we'll fill that into the table. Now basically what we're gonna do is hold on to those coordinates and use them just a little bit later on in the problem. So just keep in mind that right now we know that horizontally the projectile has traveled that 17.67 meters and then vertically it's traveled that 15.3 meters. But the next phase of our problem will actually involve conserving momentum. So let's take a look at that. And specifically, we're going to be conserving momentum in the x direction. Now, we can do that because there are no horizontal forces acting on the projectile. And in that case, momentum will be conserved. And once again, we'll be defining the initial point right here and then the final point at the height of the trajectory. And so in the x direction, we could write the following. We would have the initial mass represented by capital M times the initial velocity in the x direction. Remember, we're conserving momentum in the x direction. And that's going to equal the momentum in the x direction after the explosion. And since the projectile explodes into two pieces, we've denoted m1 and m2 for those two pieces. And then we're multiplying by the final velocity of each piece. Now, one of the pieces drops straight down. And that means that its velocity in the x direction will be zero meters per second. So that's actually going to eliminate this term right here. And then the other piece carries on in the horizontal direction. And the mass of that piece is actually going to be half of the original. If we go back and read here, it says the shell explodes into two fragments of equal mass. So if the original mass was capital M, that means the mass of one of the particles after the explosion will be half of that value. And so we can fill one half capital M in for that mass. Now mass will cancel since it appears on both the left and right hand side of the equation. On the left side we're looking for that initial velocity in the x direction which we recall was 20 times the cosine of 60 degrees and we're setting that equal to one half times the final velocity of that second fragment. We can easily solve for that velocity by multiplying both sides by two. And we get 20 meters per second. So just keep in mind again what this actually represents. This is the final velocity after the explosion of that second piece. And it's going to be traveling off in the x direction. Now, we still haven't finished the problem because we have to find the distance that it travels in relation to its original position. 
And to do that, we turn to the third phase of this problem, which is another projectile motion problem. What we're going to do is define the initial point right here, and then the final point will be when that second fragment reaches the ground. And we're going to set up another projectile motion table. Now, going to our initial position, we know that that second fragment had an initial velocity in the x direction of 20 meters per second. That's just what we figured out by conserving momentum. Its initial velocity in the y direction, of course, is zero because it's only moving horizontally initially. The final velocity in the x direction is 20 because the acceleration is zero. We don't know the final velocity in the y direction. We do know the acceleration is negative 9.8. We also know the displacement in the y direction. Remember that this second piece is going to fall a vertical displacement of negative 15.3 meters. We had found that displacement earlier in the problem. So we'll fill that in for the displacement in the y direction. In the x direction, we don't know the displacement. We're going to make it our objective to first find the time. And to do that, we can turn to the information in the y direction. Again, the initial velocity in the y direction for this phase of the problem was zero, so this term drops out. We can multiply both sides of the equation by two, divide by the acceleration, and then take the square root in order to isolate time. We'll then fill in the known values. And when we compute that, we once again get that 1.767 seconds. That actually should not be surprising because the particle has to fall the same displacement in the y direction as it did in the initial part of the problem. But regardless, that turns out to be the correct time for both the y direction and the x direction. Now that we have the time, we can finally solve for the displacement marked x in the diagram by using this equation once again. The acceleration in the x direction was zero, so we can knock out that term. And then that delta x will equal the initial velocity in the x direction times the time that we had just found. And we get 35.35 meters. Now, keep in mind what that x represents. That's the displacement that we've marked in the diagram right here. The question didn't want that displacement per se. It wanted the full distance from where it crashes to the ground all the way to its initial launch point. So we simply have to take the x that we just found and add it to 17.7. And so when we do that, we get roughly 53 meters. So this would turn out to be the total distance that the question was looking for and the correct answer. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, click the thumbs up icon and subscribe so you can stay tuned for other videos. You can send your own question into the email address on the screen and I'll do my best to answer it on YouTube.